Tonight and Monday morning, I'm going to speak on a theme which I've given a title to. The title is Portrait of a Queen. And I'm going to take my thoughts from the book of Esther. Tonight I'm going to speak on the theme, The Queen God is Seeking. On Monday morning, I'll speak on the theme, The Queen Meets the Challenge. First of all, I need to say a little bit about my approach to the book of Esther. I came to know the Lord in a dramatic way, personally, in an army barrack room of the British Army in July 1941, which brings it home to me that within a few months I will have known the Lord for a full 40 years. Shortly after that, the British Army transferred me to North Africa. And I spent the next three years in the deserts of North Africa, Egypt, Libya, and the Sudan. In that situation, I had no church, I had no chaplain, I had no Christian fellowship for 90% of the time. The only sources of spiritual life I had were the Bible and the Holy Spirit. And looking back, I realized it was tough, but it was very blessed. And during that period in the desert, I read the Bible through a number of times. And the Holy Spirit interpreted scripture for me in a marvelous way. I came from a background of really no knowledge of the Bible, a little bit of biblical history. I didn't have any previous knowledge of the doctrines of salvation. I hadn't ever sat under preachers who interpreted the Bible in a spiritual way. So I was totally dependent on the Holy Spirit. And I'd have to say, looking back, during those three years, the Holy Spirit gave me the basic foundational knowledge of scriptural truth, which has kept me going ever since. Although, of course, I'm continually adding. And this way of looking at the book of Esther that I'm going to present to you tonight came to me then in the desert, which was really a kind of miracle because many of you are used to hearing preachers who understand typology and will present types and patterns and so on. I'd never heard a preacher like that in my life. I want to make it clear this is a very individual approach to the book of Esther. I'm not saying it's the only way. I'm not even saying it's the best way to interpret the book, but it's the way that's been real for me for nearly 40 years. And I'm going to focus on two or three main characters in the book. The king, Ahasuerus, the king of the Persian Empire, Mordecai, the Jew, who sat in his gate, and Esther, who became the queen. And uh, all through I'm going to use King Ahasuerus as a picture of another king, Jesus Christ. It's said in the book of Esther that Ahasuerus was a king of kings. He ruled over other kings. Jesus is called also the king of kings. I'm aware that in many areas the character of Ahasuerus fell far below that of our Lord Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, I believe in many ways he's a vivid picture in this book of the King of Kings. And I'm going to take Esther as a picture of the Bride of Christ, the Church. But the church, particularly in her role as a queen. Let me mention a book that has blessed me and many others. I have no direct connection with the book. It's by a writer named Paul Bilheimer, who I understand is now over 80 years old. It's called Destined for the Throne. It's a short, simple book. It's not heavy theology. And its theme is that the Church of Jesus Christ is in training to share the throne with Christ as his queen throughout eternal ages. And that we will not understand much of what happens in our lives as Christians unless we realize 
we are already being trained to rule. And so that's the way I'm going to look at Esther as a picture of the church, the bride of Christ, who is going to become queen and share the throne of the universe with her Lord, the bridegroom, throughout eternity. Before I turn to the book itself, I would like to read two passages that speak about Christ as King and the Church as His Queen and His Bride. The first passage is found in Psalm 45. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version, which is incidentally why I have my glasses on. You might not see the connection, but I can read the King James without my glasses because I know it by heart. And the version I have of the New International Version has got large enough print for me to read that also without my glasses. This version, the New American Standard, is very small, very compact, very nice to travel with, but the print is a little small. So we're going to start at the first verse of Psalm 45. I've never noticed this, but I'm going to start with the opening phrases. For the choir director. In Hebrew, that's la menatseach. Menatseach itself is a fantastic word, because it's connected with a word that means a choir director, it means victory, and it means eternity. It's one of those fascinating Hebrew words that says so much in one word. According to Shoshanim, Shoshanim is the name of a certain type of melody, and it means either roses or lilies. Then it says a maskil for the sons of Korah. The word maskil means something that's very skillful musically. So it's got a rather elaborate title, this psalm, all of which leads us to anticipate it's going to say something striking. And its theme is the king. And then it begins as follows. My heart overflows with a good theme. I address my verses to the king. King with a capital K in this version. It's the king. The king revealed in human history is Jesus. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. And then begins these passages extolling and lifting up this glorious and beautiful king. Thou art fairer than the sons of men. Grace is poured upon thy lips. Therefore God has blessed thee forever. Note the therefore. God blessed Jesus not because he was a favored son, but because he deserved it. And the first way in which he deserved it was the grace of his lips. Grace is poured upon thy lips, therefore God has blessed thee forever. You remember that when men were sent to arrest him, they listened to him speaking for a while and went back without arresting him. And when the temple rulers said, why didn't you arrest him? They said, no one ever spoke like this man. They were arrested by the grace of his lips. <laughs> and then we see him as a mighty conquering king. Verse 3, gird thy sword on thy thigh, O mighty one, in thy splendor and thy majesty. And in thy majesty ride on victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Not for national pride or aggrandizement as most earthly kings go to war. Let thy right hand teach thee awesome things. Thine arrows are sharp. The peoples fall under thee. Thine arrows are in the heart of the king's enemies. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of uprightness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of joy above thy fellows. Notice the second therefore. And again we see the blessing of God the Father upon Jesus was not favoritism. There was a reason. The reason this time is, thou hast loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God has anointed thee with the oil of joy above all thy companions. 
Let me point out two things. First of all, if you want to be anointed with the oil of joy, follow Jesus as your pastor. Love righteousness and hate wickedness. Secondly, let me point out that in matters of righteousness and wickedness, there's no neutrality. If you love righteousness, you have to hate wickedness. You cannot compromise in matters of wickedness. If you do not hate wickedness, you do not love righteousness. And then this beautiful picture of his garments, verse 8. All thy garments are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. A little later on, in the picture of the queen, we'll come again to the word myrrh, so notice it. Out of ivory palaces, stringed instruments have made thee glad. Verse 9 introduces the queen. King's daughters are among thy noble ladies. At thy right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. So the queen, the bride, is singled out from all the other ladies. There are many honorable ladies present, but she stands at the king's right hand attired in the purest gold. And then there's a word to the one who's to become the queen. Listen, O daughter. Give attention and incline your ear. Forget your people in your father's house. Then the king will desire your beauty. Because he is your lord, bow down to him. That's somewhat in line with what Ron Milton was telling us. If you once get a vision, you'll leave things behind. Forget where you came from. Forget your father's house. Don't look back to the past. Because your future is in your relationship with the king. And if you give your heart to him and bow down and worship and serve him, that's the way of life. Verse 12, the daughter of Tyre will come with a gift. The rich among the people will entreat your favor. The daughter of Tyre represents really the commercial world. And uh, the prediction is that the world of commerce will come and serve Christ and his queen. Verse 13, the king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is interwoven with gold. She will be led to the king in embroidered work. The virgins, her companions who follow her, will be brought to thee. They will be led forth with gladness and rejoicing. They will enter into the king's palace. We'll, we'll stop there and not consider the last two verses. Here's a picture of the king in his beauty, his majesty, his strength, and a picture of the bride who's to be queen, clothed with tremendously beautiful and costly garments, privileged to stand in the unique place at his right hand. Now that's just a scriptural basis for the symbolism that I'm going to be using in Esther. Let's turn also to the book of Ephesians for a moment in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 through 27. And this speaks about two things, the relationship between husband and wife, but also the relationship between Christ and the church as his bride. And it brings out the same basic principles. It starts with the natural but moves to the spiritual. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the saviour of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her by his sacrifice on the cross, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. Again, that's in line with what Ron said about vision. 
I wonder if you have a vision of what God plans for his church, his bride. If you have that vision, it'll change the way you live. You'll have a vision that God can bring us into a place where we're truly holy, we're blameless, we're glorious, glorified with his glory, bestowed upon us out of his love and grace. It's a high calling to be a queen. As many of you know, I come from a British background. And Britain still has a royal family. And I'm neither pro nor against monarchy, that's not my point. But as a Britisher, I would like to say that for many years now, the royal family in Britain has been a tremendously stabilizing influence in that country. And especially the present queen has gained the respect and the love of almost all her subjects, regardless of political affiliation. And I can remember many years ago when I was at Eton College, and Eton is just across the River Thames from Windsor, where the castle is, where the royal family resides. Many Sunday afternoons, we Eton boys would go up to Windsor Castle and stand there in front, and two little girls in pink dresses would come out and wave to us. That was Elizabeth and Margaret. At that time, there was no prospect that either of them would become heirs to the throne. And then, of course, things happened with, the, with Prince Edward and his abdication and all that. And Elizabeth stepped onto the throne. But even in those days, one got an impression of how they were being groomed for royalty. Uh, they were taught everything, how to wave, how to stand, how to smile, and especially with Elizabeth. Her whole life was directed toward being able to take a place of royalty. So it's not a little responsibility to be destined to be a queen. It affects everything about you from your earliest years. And I believe all that should be true of the church. It's not a little responsibility that we are destined to be the queen. The queen of the universe throughout eternity. It's a staggering thought. Now, with that in mind, I want to turn to the book of Esther, and I'm going to start reading a number of passages. It will make it easier for you to appreciate what I'm going to say if you're familiar with the book in some measure. And if you're not, you'll just have to get along as best you can here this evening, but I would like to suggest that before Monday, if you're going to be back on Monday for the second installment, you take time to read at least the first five chapters of the book. It won't take you very long. I'm going to begin with the opening verses. And the first section that I'm going to speak about, I entitle, The Two Banquets. I'm going to begin at the beginning now. Now it took place in the days of Ahasuerus, the new international version calls him Xerxes. The Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces dominated the entire Middle East. In those days as King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne which was in Susa, the capital. In the third year of his reign he gave a banquet for all his princes and attendants, the army officers of Persia and Media, the nobles, and the princes of his provinces being in his presence. When he displayed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor of his great majesty for many days, 180 days. And when these days were completed, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days for all the people who were present in Susa, the capital, from the greatest to the least, in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were hangings of fine white and violet linen held by cords of fine purple linen on silver rings 
and marble columns, and couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels of various kinds, and the royal wine was plentiful according to the king's bounty. The Hebrew says according to the hand of the king. And drinking was done according to the law. There was no compulsion, for so the king had given orders to each official of his household that he should do according to the desires of each person. Now I'm going to ask my wife to supplement that to me, and I'll pass it on to you, verse 8, with the new international version, because it comes out a little more clear. All right. By the king's command, it's the same whether you say command or command, as long as you get the message. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink in his own way. For the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished, which I think makes it a little more vivid. Now, here's where I'm going to take a flight of fancy. And I hope you'll be able to follow me. I'm not tying you down to this as the authorized and final interpretation of the book of Esther. Well, here we have this great king of kings. And he has two banquets. The first one is a very lengthy affair. It lasts 180 days. Have you ever been invited to a 180-day banquet? I tell you, they did things in a big way. <laughs> Let me make an observation. We tend to think, you know, that humanity is progressing, things are getting better. That's not the Bible picture. Uh, in the book of Daniel, we have the four great Gentile empires portrayed. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And incidentally, this revelation was given to King Nebuchadnezzar in a dream and in a dream he saw an image, and when he woke up he couldn't even remember the dream. But it was God's view of the course of Gentile empire. And really it's almost comical how little real significance God attaches to it. It was a, an image seen in a dream, and the man who dreamed it forgot it. <laughs> and had to have it interpreted by Daniel. But, in the course of these four empires, in the image that was seen in the dream, it starts at the head, the top, and goes down to the feet, the bottom. That's the course of history in God's view. It starts with a head of gold, it moves down to a breast of silver, to loins of bronze, to legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. In other words, it's getting baser and cheaper all the way down. That's exact opposite of the teaching which is assumed today in most places in the Western world that we're progressing. Everything is getting better and bound to go on getting better. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's just by the way. All right, but I was saying that they did things in a big way in those days. You'll never, you'll never find any king that'll have a 180-day banquet. I'll, I'll challenge you, all the days we're alive, there'll never be one. But people don't think that big today. But this 180-day banquet was only for the, the top brass. It was for the princes, the commanders, the satraps, the governors. Now, to me, this represents the past history of the universe. When God is dealing with angels and archangels and all sorts of tremendously superior and powerful beings, and it's gone on a long, long while. Then comes this feast of seven days, this banquet, which to me represents the gospel dispensation. Very brief in the light of the whole course of history. One of the things that the gospel continually emphasizes is there's just a little while. While you have opportunity. 
not going to last long. You say, well, it's lasted nearly 2,000 years. In Psalm 90, it tells us that in God's sight, a thousand years is as a day. And it comes even further down, it says it's like a watch in the night. The whole period of 24 hours was divided into day and night. Twelve hours each. The night was divided into four watches, three hours each. So a thousand years in God's sight is no longer than three hours. No. In other words, in God's sight, it's just a very brief, fleeting moment. It says uh, that now, in the end of time, Jesus appeared. Wouldn't be the end of time by our view of time, but in God's view of time, it's the end. Now this gospel banquet was different. It was very intimate. It wasn't for people from far, but it was just for the people right at hand. The king invited them right into his palace gardens. And he put on everything for them. The uh, gardens were beautiful enough, but then think of the place being decorated with white, white and violet linen held by cords of fine purple linen on silver rings to marble columns. Picture this tall place filled with marble columns with silver rings and these beautiful linen hangings of white and violet suspended everywhere. And then the couches, the seats, were made of gold and silver. And the, the, the floor was a mosaic pavement with porphyry, which is a red stone, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stone. Where have you ever walked on a pavement that was precious stone? And then the drinks were served only in golden vessels. How many of us have drunk out of golden vessels? And they were just according to everybody's individual taste. There was no compulsion. However much you wanted, whatever kind of wine you wanted, that was what you got. That to me is like the gospel. It's for everybody. It's not just for the mighty. It's held in the setting of unique, intimate beauty and loveliness. And everything is the best. Nothing is less than silver. And you're catered for as an individual. It's just the kind of wine you want in the vessel of your selection. You can have red, you can have white, you can have sparkling wine. You can have it ice cold or you can have it room temperature. That's the gospel to me. It's the riches of God made available to the poor, the underprivileged, the people who never had gone into the king's palace before. And everything is done for you as an individual. God knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows your tastes. He knows your weaknesses. He caters for you individually. Now, at the close of this second banquet, the king had planned a special climax. He was going to bring out his queen in her royal attire, present her to the people, and let them all admire her beauty. But at that point, things didn't work out. We read the next verses. Verse 9. Queen Vashti, also gave a banquet for the women in the palace which belonged to King Ahasuerus. Now here's the queen. King is having his banquet. The queen is having her banquet. I want to say to you right now that to me Vashti is a picture of a church that God will reject. The other, Esther, is the picture of the queen that God will receive. And we notice that there's 
There's a kind of separation. Vashti's in the king's palace, but she's doing her own thing. She's got the women. And she's so busy with her own program, that when the summons comes, she turns it down. Let's read. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Bitsa, Harbona, Bigsa, Abagsa, Zipha, and Karkas, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown, in order to display her beauty to the people and the princes, for she was beautiful. Let me observe there, I, I, I heard somebody say once that Vashti was right to refuse because she was going to be asked to make some kind of indecent display of herself. I don't believe that. I've lived in the Middle East, and I think I know pretty well the mentality of the men of the Middle East. I'm not saying that they would be above an indecent display of some kind of woman. But believe me, no self-respecting Middle Eastern male would ever make an indecent display of his wife. He would have no self-respect left. So I cannot accept that interpretation that says that Vashti refused because she didn't want to expose herself. And there's no suggestion of it in the text. Verse 12, But <clears throat> Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. Then the king became very angry, and his wrath burned within him. Then the king said to the wise men who understood the times, for it was the custom of the king, so to speak, before all who knew law and justice and were close to him. And then we have the names of seven princes. Karshina, Shifa, Admasa, Tarshish, Meres, Mastina, and Memokan, the seven princes of Persia and Media who had access to the king's presence and sat in the first place in the kingdom. The king addressed this question to them. According to the law, what is to be done with Queen Vashti? because she did not obey the command of King Ahasuerus, delivered by the eunuchs. And in the presence of the king and the princes, Memukan, one of these seven princes, said, Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also all the princes and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, causing them to look with contempt on their husbands by saying, King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought into his presence, but she did not come. And this day the ladies of Persia and Media, who have heard of the Queen's conduct, will speak in the same way to all the King's princes, and there will be plenty of contempt and anger. If it pleases the King, let a royal edict be issued by him, and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, so that it cannot be repealed that Vashti should come no more into the presence of King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is more worthy than she. Then all the women will give honor to their husbands, great and small. This word pleased the king and the princes. The king did as Mamukan proposed. <clears throat> 